What's going on everybody? Welcome to part six of the Neural Networks from Scratch video series. In this video, what we're gonna be talking about and covering is the softmax activation function, which is specifically used for the output layer on our classification style neural network models. Before we get into that, a uh, quick update. The uh, Neural Networks from Scratch book is now fully released. Uh, we have a hard cover, which you see here, as well as a soft cover. Also the ebook now has a PDF download. Uh, all books give you access to that PDF and ebook, and we still also have the Google Docs, so you can still highlight and ask questions in line with the text and all that. If you're interested in any version of the book, you can get it at nnfs.io. I am going to be coding everything from the book, so you should be able to watch the videos, read the book, and kind of cross back and forth with very little uh, effort. That way, if maybe you've coded something from the video and then you're still maybe a little confused, you want to get a refresher, you could go in theory back to the book, for example, um, and kind of go through the exact same code just in written form or vice versa and so on. So anyway, uh, we're going to be starting off here with the softmax activation function. And the first question that I'm sure many people will have is, uh, why another activation function? Why don't we just continue to use something like the rectified linear activation function? So um, I think to start us off, uh, I would say, let's just, I'm gonna start with this, a fresh script here uh, just for illustration purposes. Uh, and then once we actually code the code that we intend to con you know, continue with our, essentially we're building a framework here. So um, for that code, we'll go back to the code that we've been building. Um, but for now, we're just gonna start fresh. So let's just say you've got some layer outputs and the values can be anything. We're just gonna make them up, but I am gonna use the values from the book. 4.8, 1.21, 2.385. So imagine these are your output values. What do we do with that? So if we're only predicting, it's pretty simple. You do, you just, you would say the prediction is whichever one of these values is the, is the largest. So in this case, it would be index zero. So let's assume index zero is indeed the intended target. Um, awesome, you got your prediction right, but what we're trying to learn how to do is actually train neural networks as well. So with a, uh, you don't have to think about this if all you're doing is predicting, but someone had to think about it at some point to train this model. So if you want to train a model, the, you know, there's a, a whole bunch that goes on that we will get to and that will take up many videos and, and many uh, hours of your time to figure out and learn how this works. But um, at this point, the first step in training a model is to determine how wrong is this model, right? Because accuracy is not a good indication of that. So for example, uh, if we change some of these values, maybe 4.79 and 4.25, uh, I don't know. Um, which, one of, which one of these is more correct? Well, I think probably most people would agree this first one is more correct because relatively this neuron zero here is relatively larger than the other neurons um, in this list, whereas here they're actually a lot closer. Accuracy wise, they're identical. Um, so, so in order to measure how wrong something is, we're, we first the first order of business is to compare them relatively to other neurons. But the problem with this is like the rectified linear activation function, for example, is exclusive. It's per neuron, they're not really connected in any way. So there, there is no relative comparison that you could really fairly make. Uh, the next problem is these are unbounded. So the relative closeness can vary considerably between you know each sample that you pass through this neural network. So we have, we've got so many issues. We've got, the, there's like a bounding issue. Every neuron's exclusive. They don't really relate to each other. Um, and we, we just, we don't really have a good solid way of determining um, how wrong is this in, in any formal uh, uniform way per sample that comes through. So um, this is the problem and this is why we need some new activation function, which in this case, we're going to be using the softmax activation function to help us solve. Now, why softmax? Well, we need to kind of, again, kind of consider what's our, what's our end objective here? So zooming out to a full model for the moment, uh, what, are, what, what actually do we want to happen? So let's say we've got some image data, we're gonna pass that through the neural network, and then we get the output values. Now, what do we want those values to be? So ideally, these values would be 
a probability distribution. Uh, this gives us the ability for, uh, well, it gives us a few things. First of all, this means everything will be uniform from sample to sample. Also, from neuron to neuron, things will be normalized. And we can actually calculate rightness and, and wrongness, so to speak. So in this case, the, the, the correct classification, if everything was perfect, uh, the, the correct classification would be a 1.0 and the, all the other neurons would read out 0.0, right? Um, so, so now we can actually begin to, to, to measure how right or how wrong are we. So we know this is where we want to get, and the question is, how do we actually get to that point? So one immediate idea here might be, well, all you need to really do is normalize the values and create that distribution by taking each neuron's value and divide that value by the total value of all the neurons in that layer. And then you're done, right? So let's say you just use a probability distribution and you keep old faithful rectified linear activation function. The problem here is if any of those values in the output layer is a negative, uh, the rectified linear activation function is going to clip it and it's just going to be a zero and then when we go to create a probability distribution from that it will always be zero whether it was a negative 20 or negative 9000 <laughs> and then the other problem is what if all of the values are in the negatives uh, there, there would be it would be impossible to learn from here and in, and again we haven't quite yet reached back propagation but learning from clipped values, um, how, quote unquote, how wrong or how right is something uh, is very difficult because there is no meaning once you've clipped, you've lost all meaning. Was it a negative 20 before it got clipped or was it a negative 1 million? We don't know. So then you might suggest, let's just use a linear activation function. Let's basically do nothing. The problem is uh, you're still going to need to figure out what the heck do you do with these negative values. <laughs> so you might throw your hands up at this point and be like, let's just use absolute values or let's square the output. Then we'll just solve this whole negative problem altogether. The problem with this is after you have these values, you need to be able to backpropagate. You need to be able to have an optimizer intelligently optimize your variables. Well, if you have a negative nine that got absolute value to a nine, that's a big difference than a nine. <laughs> Right? Um, so the variables that you would need to tweak and the directions that you would need to tweak these variables to get those changes that you want would vary. <laughs> so so we, we can't just lose the meaning. A negative 9 is not the same as a positive 9. So what the heck do we do? Enter exponentiation. So the exponential function is y, or your output, is equal to e, or Euler's number, raised to the power of x, which is your input. Euler's number is approximately 2.71828 and so on. And exponentiation is the act of applying the exponential function to some value. So what this does for us is it solves our negatives issue by making sure no negative uh, or really no value can be negative at the output of the exponential function. And it does this while not tossing away the value or the meaning of that negativity. It's still on a scale, let's say. So the exponentiation of 1.1 is 3 or three and some change. The exponentiation of negative 1.1 is 0 0.3329 or so. So this is more than just using absolute values or squaring the value, for example. Now also, in theory, you don't have to use Euler's number here and you would still solve all your problems up to this point. Uh, but Euler's number is actually going to be coming in handy later on. We'll be sure to reference that when we get there. But this is how we're solving the, those, this problem of negativity. All right, getting back to our code, let's code the raw Python implementation for exponentiation. So to do this, we're just going to keep the original layer outputs. And first, we need a definition for E, the constant Euler's number, and that is 2.718281. 182846. I hope I got that right. Um, also, if you are in Python, you can always import math, and then rather than hard coding uh, Euler's number that way, you could say e equals math.e. And that would be the same thing. But if they are following along in some other language and you don't have that kind of math library that just gives you the number, you could just hard code it in that way. So uh, once we have that number, <clears throat> we want to exponentiate all each of these values. So doing that is really basic Python here. So we're going to say x values. We're going to make that an empty list. And then we're just going to iterate over layer outputs. So for output in layer outputs, we're going to x values dot append 
um, e to the power, actually it's capital E to the power of uh, whatever that output is. And then when we're all done, we can print exp values. Let's go ahead and run that. And we have our exponentiated uh, values at this point, checking the book to make sure it is identical. And it looks like it is. Okay, great. So that's exponentiation, really not much to it at that point. Uh, so the next step, once we've exponentiated these values, is to normalize the values. So what do we mean by normalize the values? So in our case, it's going to be a single output neuron's value divided by the sum of all of the other output neurons in that output layer. And this gives us the probability distribution that we, that we want. But we still want to exponentiate before this point because, again, we need to get rid of all of these negative values, but we do not want to lose the meaning of the negative value. So we're exponentiating to convert negatives to positives without actually losing the meaning of a negative value. So continuing along in our raw Python implementation here, uh, let's go ahead and code in normalization. So again, normalization occurs after we've done exponentiation, which will rid us of these pesky negative values. So to do the normalization, again, it's a single value divided by the total of all the values. So we've got exponential values. So what we're going to say is norm base equals the sum of those exponential values. And then we're going to say norm uh, values is, that what we're, yeah, is an empty list. And then we are going to iterate over, so we're gonna say for value in x values, we're going to do norm, uh, norm values dot append, and it's just going to be that value uh, divided by uh, the norm base. And this will give us the normalized value, so we can print norm values. And then also, uh, this should add up, it should add up to one or very, very close to one. So uh, print the sum of norm values. We'll run that, and what we get is here is our probability distribution. So this first this first kind of list here, this is our exponentiated values. Then this is our normalized exponentiated values, and then this just sums it up and shows that it does indeed add up to basically one. Those values should be pretty close to what's in the book. It actually isn't exactly, um, but this isn't using NumPy. So the values should line up, I think, when we're using NumPy. Um, I'll, we'll confirm that when we get there. Um, but so the NNFS, first of all, we're not even initializing the NNFS package, but that is part of what the init package is doing. But here, interestingly enough, even raw Python seems to vary from machine to machine. Anyways, uh, it should be very close to those values. And since we're not actually training a model or anything, it, it's I don't think it actually matters at this stage. So... Um, I mean, they're close, but it's like as you get to some of these latter decimals, that's where it's differing. So this, that was the, uh, that's the raw Python implementation. And again, if you're coming from some other language, you would need to implement this in, in your language. Uh, but now the next thing that we're going to do is convert this to NumPy. So, uh, so what we're going to do is take, uh, I guess in our code, we probably are retaining E, but we can keep math.e there, uh, outputs there. We're going to go ahead and import uh, NumPy as NP. And rather than uh, doing really all of this, we delete and exp values just becomes NP.exp. And what are we exponential? What are we applying this exponential function to? Layer outputs. So by default, typically NumPy functions, what they're going to do is uh, first they will, they will just by default impact every value. Um, and if you want it to be a little more in a little bit more specific way, you can become more specific and we'll actually be showing that very shortly. Um, but by default, if you just do this, it's going to apply this to each value um, in total. So that's a quicker way to get our exponential values. And then for the normalization values, all we need to do at this point is we're just going to say norm underscore values is equal to the exp, uh, exp values divided by the np dot sum of the exp values. So let's go ahead and run that real quick. And then we see that we do indeed still get the uh, same value or same ish values. And this time it actually does line up with what's in the book. But if you wanted to be super particular, I would imagine we would import NNF, oops, NNFS and NNFS.init 
Um, these values actually do line up with what is in the book, but let's just run that one more time. And so if you did have any variance there, hopefully that would change it. Um, so, okay, so that lines up exactly. And as you can see, it's a little shorter code. I think it's a little more legible, um, but yeah. So that is our, um, our exponentiation and then our normalization. So to sum up everything up to this point for our coding of the softmax activation function, we have input, right, which is actually going to be the output layer of data that we're going to input into this, this activation function. We exponentiate those, those input values, so each one uniquely gets exponentiated. Then we normalize, and then that becomes our output. So the combination of this exponentiation and normalization is what makes up the softmax activation function, the formula for which is this. And hopefully this formula is actually pretty simple to understand at this point, since you've already seen the code that goes into it and it's not really complicated in any way. Okay, so at this point, we know everything that goes into the softmax activation function, and now it is just a function of actually applying and implementing this in such a way that makes sense for our actual neural network applications. So the main issue that we have at this stage is we are currently working with a single kind of vector here of a layer's outputs when really we're not going to have a single layer of outputs. We're actually, or we're not gonna have a single output from a layer. We're going to have a batch of these outputs because we're gonna have a batch of inputs and that's going to produce a batch of outputs. <clears throat> so the next thing we wanna do is convert this uh, and, and really all this to work as a batch. So to do that, uh, first, let's con let's make this an actual uh, batch. And again, I am going to use the same values that we have in the book. So let me paste and paste. And the second output here is an 8.9, negative 1.81, 0 0.2. And then down here we get a 1.41, 1.051, 0.026. Okay. Um, also, we can kind of clean up here. I just realized we still have math and math.e. We don't need that anymore because uh, this handles it for us. So how do we convert to batch? <clears throat> so for exponentiating, uh, it turns out we don't actually need to do anything because uh, these NumPy functions here work by default at the individual value uh, level. So if we print x values, uh, I thought I did, I thought I auto completed that, I guess I didn't. Um, there we have our values. It's actually already done for us uh, and, and it's correct. So the next question is, okay, how do we do this step? So x values, we don't need to change anything there for a batch, but for some, we do. So uh, to illustrate sum, rather than doing the sum of the exponential values, it's kind of hard to visually add these up. Um, we're going to do the sum of, um, let's do this. I'm just gonna comment these out. Uh, we are going to, let's just print uh, np.sum uh, layer outputs. Now remember, what do we wanna do here? <clears throat> we actually, want to iterate over here, over this 2D matrix. We want to iterate over this and do this, the sum, this sum, this sum, and this sum. But by default, I already told you, it's gonna do as individual values. So by default, what we get is a, a single scalar value. That's not what we wanted. We really want three values. For sure we want three values. So how do we get those three values? So the first order of business is to pass the axes um, parameter here. So we're gonna say axes, and the axes by default is actually none, and that gives us the same value that we saw before. Um, axes zero, to put it extremely simply on a 2D matrix, it's going to be the sum of columns. So we're gonna run this again, and as you can see, 15.11, um, is this column, and then 0 0.451 is this column, and 2.611 is, is this last column. 
Unfortunately, <clears throat> that's not what we want. We actually want the sum of the rows, put simply. So we can change that to axes one, and sure enough, uh, what we get is what we hoped for, which is the sum here, here, and here. Now we still have a slight problem. What, we're, what are we trying to do with this sum? Well, it turns out we're trying to take these exponential values, which has this shape. It's, it is a matrix. And we're attempting to divide it um, by what we do the sum operation with. And we don't actually want to just willy-nilly divide it. It's really important that things line up. So it's for the same reason that we want to make sure values are lining up um, when we do the dot product uh, and, and when we're doing like a matrix product, right? So even though np dot dot, it is a dot product with vectors, but it's also doing a matrix product for us, we need those values to line up. So we do a transpose, right? For that same reason, we need the right values to line up here. Right now, if we did this, <clears throat> it's gonna, um, it's not going to actually be dividing what, what we want <laughs> um, exponentials to be divided by, right? Uh, so, so, so what we wanna do is we need to shape this correctly. And we could reshape this, uh, but we can also just simply use keep dims. So keep, uh, is it keep dims? Yeah, all one word, and then true, run that. And now it is a matrix of the exact same, um, I hate to say shape, but it, it, it's the same um, orientation. It's the same dimensions, okay? Uh, so, so it's just a sum. So now it is literally this right here. It's just the sum of these values, the sum of these values, and then the sum of these values. So with that, what we can do is we can say the norm values is exponential values divided by the sum of exponential values at axes one, and then keep dims equals true. We get rid of this row here. And now we have uh, print norm values. We run that, and now we have our actual normalized values. So uh, from this point, um, we really have one more thing, and I think we'll cover it here, is um, uh, one problem that we have up to this point is with, with specifically exponential values. Um, so there's, there's one thing that we want to change with this exponential values before we convert this to our actual class object. So, um, so with that, let us go ahead and talk about um, what we're going to do with exponential values. One slight issue with exponentiation is the explosion of values as the input to the exponential function grows. It doesn't take much to get massive numbers, and even worse, it doesn't take too long to reach an overflow. So one way to combat this overflow is to take all of the values in this output layer prior to exponentiation and subtract the largest value in that layer from all of the values in that layer. And what this causes is the now the largest value will be a zero and everything else is going to be less than zero. Now, because the largest value prior to exponentiation is actually a zero, our range of possibilities becomes somewhere between uh, zero and one after exponentiation because the exponentiation of zero equals one. So this means our range of values can only be between zero and one, thus no more worrying about overflowing. So the final concern that you might have is what sort of impact does subtracting the max value um, from everything have on the actual output of the softmax activation function. So all other things being equal and assuming that we don't have some sort of uh, overflow error, if we have two, two, two output layers and one we don't subtract the max from and one we do, um, after we do our exponentiation and our normalization, the actual output is identically the same. The only thing we've done is protected ourselves from uh, an actual overflow error. All right, so with the subtraction of the max value in mind, uh, we are going to now go to the code that we left off on with uh, part five, and we're going to add our softmax activation class, and then we're going to implement it here as well as change 
things here. I've kind of I've used different variable names and stuff like that. So I'm going to attempt to convert this to be exactly what we have in the book as well. Um, and so and by doing that, we'll also be able to finally test the softmax activation function. So uh, these are the changes that we want to make. So first off, uh, we're going to be redefining this data. So I'm actually going to delete these. Then uh, we'll just add this underneath the ReLU activation function. And we're going to say class um, activation, activation underscore softmax. And then we're going to define the forward method, again, self inputs. And now we're just going to implement the code that we've talked about and covered already up to this point, except for the max thing. But I'm going to show you that in a moment. So the exponential underscore values is going to be equal to np.exp of inputs. And then we want to minus the np.max. And immediately, alarm bells should be sort of going off. And that is. If we run np.max and we, for example, we're going to say np.max inputs. And also, while we're here, um, what is inputs? So up to this point, inputs, in this case, because we're using the softmax activation function for the activation function of an output layer, inputs are actually the outputs <laughs> so far of our model, right? And so again, we've got these outputs, and those outputs are going to be in batch form. So there will be a batch of these outputs. So if we just said np.max of inputs, which would be an np.max of a batch of outputs up to this point, it's going to be the highest value of all of those values. Now, you'd probably get away with it. <laughs> um, I, I think it would probably work, but it would be a mistake. It, it would work, but not very, not as well as it should. So instead of what, um, what you want to say is np.max inputs of, and immediately you should already know where we're headed. <laughs> it's going to be of axes one. And then again, keep dims will be true. So we're going to take inputs, which is going to be this batch of inputs. And again, we want to subtract the max along it of axes one. And then we want to keep that dimension, right? Of, of that, that um, um, array. So once we've done that, uh, we now have our exponential values of a batch and we are um, subtracting the max along the way. Again, so we don't, we just don't hit an overflow value. The actual outputs will be exactly the same um, after we uh, normalize and all that. So uh, we're not really losing anything by doing this. We're just preventing an overflow. So exponential values is done. Now we're going to say probabilities is going to be equal to exp values uh, divided by np.sum of the exponential values of axes one, axes one, keep dims is going to be true. And again, we've already actually, this we've already covered, but again, we're trying to sum uh, each of the rows and we want to keep the dimension. So finally, <clears throat> we're going to define our self.output and that is going to be the probabilities. Okay, so that's our softmax activation function. And now what I wanna make sure I do is I use the exact same layer values and so on. So uh, we already got rid of the code up above. I think, I think what I'll do, I think we'll just code it um, from scratch here. So here is our framework up to this point. Well, first thing we're gonna do is define our data. So X, Y is going to be equal to spiral data. And then we're going to say samples. How many samples do we want to have? We're going to say 100 per class. And we're going to say classes. We're going to have three separate classes. Now, I guess we'll pep eight. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say dense one is equal to layer dense. And the shape here is going to be two and then three. So we only have two input features. Again, spiral data is just X, Y data. So it's just coordinates. So the input here is gonna be X, Y, that's two. So the input must be two. Now the output could be anything you want. You could say 90 if you wanted, but we're gonna say three because we're gonna follow, we're gonna say three because we're gonna follow the book. Now, um, after we've got dense one, we're gonna, we're gonna define also activation one and that will be a activation ReLU. And then we're going to define dense two is going to be another layer dense. 
it the input because the output of the previous layer was a three. The input must be three. Now the output could be anything we want, but we're gonna treat this like it's an output layer. So how many neurons should this output layer have? Well, we have three classes, so we're gonna say three. So dense two is defined, and then we're gonna say activation, activation two is going to be an activation softmax. And then now we're gonna begin passing data actually through here. So we're gonna say dense one, dense one dot forward, and we're gonna forward our actual input data here. Uh, then we need to activate it. So activation one dot forward dense one dot uh, output. Then we're gonna pass that through dense two. So we're gonna say dense two dot forward activation one dot output and then activation two dot uh, forward the output from dense two and at this point because we do the forward we now have the output which is going to be probabilities so for example we can print activation two dot output and let's just do the there should be 300 of them so we're going to just do the first five Let's go ahead and run that. And what we get is, again, this is this is a batch. Okay, so we passed all of them at the same time in this case. So we, in theory, had a batch of 300. Now, each of these is unique. Is, is a, like, so this is a sample. So this had an input of two values, and this is each neuron value of, of those two values. And it just continues to repeat, and then this is just the first five. Now, it should be no surprise, everything was initialized randomly. So it turns out that um, the distribution of predictions is indeed random. It's a perfect, you know, well, not a perfect, but very close to a perfect one-third prediction for everything. This is totally normal. Um, when you randomly initialize a model, that's kind of what you expect. So now what we need to do is actually train this model. Because, like, for example, let's see if any of these are obviously bigger than the others. Three, 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 five. So in this case, right, if we did an argmax on this right here, um, this class, you know, of index two is the largest, unless I'm missing something, but anyways, it is the largest, it looks like. So, um, so be, that would be the prediction, and maybe that would be accurate, maybe that would be correct, but instead what we want to really do is we don't want to know just which what's right and wrong, we want to know how right and how wrong, and to calculate that, we use a loss function. And that is the topic of the next video. So uh, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, whatever, uh, up to this point, we kind of covered a lot, but I, I think the softmax activation function is relatively simplistic to pick up. Um, but if you have questions, comments, concerns, whatever, uh, feel free to leave those below. Again, the uh, physical versions of the books are done. Uh, as are obviously the ebook and all that's ready to be downloaded and consumed. So if you want to follow something to follow along with the videos or you want to kind of refresh or, or refresh from the videos or read before the video, watch video, that kind of stuff, uh, definitely check that out at nnfs.io. Otherwise, I will see you guys in another video.